adopted by partisan resolution presented to the U.S. Senate, Senate by Representative Portland, Portman, excuse me, of Ohio and Hirono of Hawaii to uh, proclaim April National Plant Month. And this was passed unanimously by the U.S. Senate. So this is pretty wonderful news and amazing um, that our Senate agreed unanimously. So, and I am so excited to be here with all of you for this wonderful talk. This is our second talk. We have over 20 more coming up. So I encourage you to go and register for all the talks, including a wonderful talk this Saturday by Doug Tallamy. He's speaking at 10 o'clock and that that one will not be recorded. It'll be speaking April 10th at 10 a.m. So please register for that and all the other wonderful ones. I will see you at the end. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So Gail will see us at the end as she facilitates the Q&A. It is my pleasure to welcome Walter Fertig and his presentation on rare and interesting plants of Zion National Park. So Walter's gonna take us on a little bit of a vacation because we've all been here since we started doing this last April, enjoying WMPS webinars. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Walter Fertig is the state botanist for the Washington National Natural Heritage Program and has been since 2017. Previously, he was the state botanist for the Wyoming Natural Heritage Program vegetation team lead for the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, curator of digital data and lichens at Arizona State University, and proprietor of a botanical consulting company in Utah. Walter is the chair of the editorial committee for Deglossia since 2019 and a member of the Washington Native Plant Society State Board of Directors. He formerly was the editor of newsletters of Wyoming and Utah Native Plant Societies. It's wonderful to have his expertise on our Deglossia team. And Walter did edit the last issue of spring 2021. I hope you all received it in your boxes to enjoy it. Uh, Walter has a master's and doctorate in botany from the other UW, the University of Wyoming. And he lives in McCleary, Washington with his wife, Laura, on a small cat and dog farm. Well, welcome, Walter. Thank you for being here. All right. Well, thank you, Denise. Thank you, Gail. Um, and thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize when we scheduled this that uh, it would be uh, coinciding with the National Basketball College Basketball Men's Championship game with the uh, our local heroes from uh, Gonzaga University. Um, I saw some of the early scores. It wasn't looking really good, but but uh, hopefully uh, they're they're doing better. But uh, anyway, um, thanks everybody. And as uh, as Denise mentioned, um, when, when she and Gail asked me to uh, uh, think about a talk for Native Plant Appreciation Month, uh, initially I thought you know talk about some interesting area or species or something in in Washington. But it occurred to me you know we've all been locked down for a year now and aren't getting out as much as we might like to, to uh, other places on vacation. But I thought uh, maybe this year would be fun to go uh, somewhere different um, and can't get much more different from Washington than uh, the Colorado Plateau of uh, Southern Utah. So uh, I, uh, as Denise mentioned, I, I used to live in Utah and uh, for a number of years I had a consulting business there. And uh, one of my uh, main clients actually was Zion National Park. Uh, they kept me employed for, for many happy years uh, doing all kinds of projects. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in the park, uh, worked on the flora of the park and um, have some, a lot of pictures and, and uh, used to teach some classes there too uh, for the, the Zion Canyon Field Institute, uh, which is part of the, Nat the Natural History Association or what used to be called the Natural History Association. They have a new name now, but um, we would do uh, guided tours uh, for small groups and so uh, I'm gonna kind of digitally give you a little tour of, of the park uh, tonight. Let's see. And suddenly my, there we go. 
Um, so you know, Zion, it's a it's a very scenic area. If you uh, you know like that like that sort of thing, uh, it is uh, our oldest national park in the in the state of Utah, and uh, certainly has uh, lots of, of great places to to go visit. Uh, and uh, certainly, there's a lot of folks who like to go there. Um, I think in 2019, they had four and a half million people uh, visit the park, which is uh, quite a lot. One one of the more uh, visited uh, parks in the whole national park system. But um, the uh, you know it's got a lot of interesting uh, uh, things to see and do and, and places to go. And one of the nice things about Zion, it, it's it's not a huge park by any stretch, about 148,000 acres. Uh, it's actually one of the smaller parks in Utah. But there are places you can go to get away uh, from the mad madding crowd, uh, which is kind of nice. If if you ever been in Zion on the Memorial Day weekend or stuck in a uh, traffic jam at the tunnel trying to get in or out. Um, you may not realize how uh, many places you can escape to with a little bit of effort uh, and not see anybody. That's one of the nice things about the area. Here's a map of Zion. Um, and I'll just point out a few areas I'll be talking about later. You can see where it's located in Utah, down in the south uh, uh, western corner of the state, kind of within the, it's called the Colorado Plateau area, which is really famous as the highest concentration of national parks and monuments in the, in the US. Uh, there's many other areas near there, and if you're a tourist, of course, you know you've got to hit all of them on one day. You got to get to, you know, Zion in the morning and and Grand Canyon by lunchtime, and and get the arches by dinner. Um, uh, Zion, uh, here's the the park itself. The the area that um, there's only a few roads that are accessible for for people during the summer. The, the east entrance road is this one uh, here, which is quite scenic. You can see my cursor, uh, perhaps. Uh, Zion Canyon itself, where uh, so many of the, the really big stone monuments are, is uh, closed to traffic during the summertime, which is a good thing because it would just be a nightmare trying to find a place to park or all the, all the traffic. Uh, they have a shuttle bus system that gets you uh, up and down up to the Virgin uh, Narrows if you want to hike through that. Um, south entrance is where most folks uh, come in. Um, just find out a couple other places I'm going to talk about a little bit. This uh, southwest corner of the, of the park, um, Botanically is one of, the, one of the interesting areas. Uh, you get some nice views of the of the uh, Navajo sandstone peaks, but the uh, vegetation and the geology is uh, quite a bit more Mojave-like uh, there. And this area in the north uh, west corner, the Kolob area, uh, it's the closest actually to the freeway. And there's a visitor center up there. Um, there's a really large natural stone arch, Kolob arch, which is uh, a, bit, a bit of a hike to get to, but it's kind of one of the main draws up in that area. So uh, definitely lots of cool places to, to explore. And uh, you know, I've spent years and years down there and still haven't hardly scratched the surface, it seems. I want to mention though, you know, before it became a park, you know, there's a long history of, of human occupation in the area uh, by, uh, by Native American cultures uh, going back at least 8,000 years. Um, during the, most of that time, uh, inhabitants were kind of uh, hunter-gatherers, if you will. Um, there was a period, though, from about 500 to 1300, where there was fairly intensive uh, agriculture uh, being, pra being practiced, uh, particularly along the east fork of the Virgin River, and uh, you know, more permanent uh, settlements and a little bit larger population. Uh, the, the, the natives were farming uh, maize and beans and squash and things like that. Um, about the 11th and 12th century, there's a, a, a very major drought throughout the southwest that really had a profound impact influence on the on the native cultures and uh, pretty much wiped out that uh, farming uh, uh, culture. Um, and so the inhabitants after that period were kind of back to hunting and, and gathering uh, in small numbers. And that was the situation uh, when the Anglos first came to the area uh, about in, in the 1850s or so. Um, one of the first explorers actually, you might recognize this fellow in the bottom picture as uh, uh, John Wesley Powell, who uh, is famous for uh, leading a, the first uh, rafting expedition through the Grand Canyon. Uh, Powell was uh, an interesting fellow. He was a, he really was a scientist by, by training, and he's sort of known as a swashbuckling uh, explorer. Uh, he's a geologist and a, an ethnographer and, and uh, studied uh, native cultures quite a bit. He really had a very modern perspective uh, on, on them, um, but he explored the Zion area and helped to uh, popularize it a little bit. Um, Starting in the 1850s, there were uh, attempts to settle the area by uh, port, uh, Mormon uh, pioneers. Uh, several small towns were, were set up. Um, 
the area is the, quite fertile along the, the river, the, the Virgin River and its tributaries, but it was very prone to flash flooding. Um, and, and actually the, the settlements that, that are listed there, two of them are actually ghost towns, Grafton and Schoonsburg were, were abandoned because they just flooded one time too many. Um, Springdale survived and now is the kind of the hub uh, around the park. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to own property there, you're probably a, a millionaire. Uh, and then the town of Rockville is still around too. Um, some of the early uh, settlers um, advocated that uh, you know the area should become a, a, a tourist de destination, and uh, so there was some uh, uh, local support for creating a national park there, and that was established in 1909 by uh, President Taft, shown here. Um, Taft was a one-term president, uh, not all that successful perhaps, but uh, under his leadership, uh, New Mexico and Arizona became states, and uh, Taft famous for later became the Chief Justice of the, of the Supreme Court. And it should be noted, he was the last president to have any facial hair. So, uh, um, and, and, and some people think he kind of looks a little bit like a walrus, but, but uh, in, in any event, he's, he set aside uh, Zion, uh, the area around Zion Canyon as a national monument under the Antiquities Act. Originally, the name for the monument was called uh, Mukuntuwi National Monument, which, um, supposedly translates uh, as a straight arrow uh, from uh, an Indian dialect of some sort. Um, there's some debate whether that actually is the definition um, or what it really referred to as the, not a lot of straight uh, reaches of the river along there. Um, perhaps because the name was hard to spell or pronounce, uh, it was later changed when, when it became a national park but through Congress in 1919, uh, renamed Zion National Park. And then later, uh, President Roosevelt set aside the area around Kolob Arch, that northwest corner of the park, as its own national monument. So that was Zion National Monument. And then in the 50s, they were merged together ad administratively. So Zion, you know, it's got lots of uh, cool amenities. Uh, you know, it's, it really was established, you know, first and foremost for its uh, many scenic uh, values, obviously, as you can see here, um, uh, the Evangelist Landing. Um, also has these really great canyons, you know, nice shady places to go in the summer when it's uh, really hot otherwise. Um, in the southwest uh, corner, like I pointed out, though, it's got these desert badlands, which look pretty cool. Um, kind of these weird gypsum formations and, and other, uh, other uh, unusual rock types and, and much more of a, a Mojave uh, kind of vibe to the, to the vegetation. But then you've got you know, nice rivers and streams. Uh, this is actually the uh, Peruna Weep Canyon, which is uh, East Fork of the Virgin River. Uh, it's part of the park, but it's not actually open. It's not accessible to the public. The, the mouth of the canyon is privately owned and, and they don't let people in very well, very often, um, but really a nice area. And this was an area that was farmed quite a bit by the, uh, the Native Americans initially. And you got all, of course, uh, you know, all sorts of historical and cultural things going on. Um, actually, I kind of like this photo in the bottom corner which is a view of Springdale, probably in the like 1870s, 1880s, uh, when it's still just a little isolated farming community, uh, and now an area where you enter the park and you know with three million of your uh, closest friends every summer. And of course, you know I have wildlife and, and recreational values as well. Uh, there's a herd of bighorn sheep uh, in the park that always causes a, a traffic jam when people see see them, and and uh, you know it's a great place to recreate. Um, Anyone from the Park Service watching, that, that is my dog, uh, Arlo. Uh, this photo was staged outside of the park. It was, he, he's off leash, but he's not technically in the park. So you don't need to alert the, the authorities or anything. Uh, but as botanists, you know, we, we know the real value of Zion is uh, because of, of its very diverse uh, flora. And uh, uh, Zion is one of, uh, let's see, there's actually 15 uh, national parks and monuments now in Utah. And it has the highest number of, of vascular plant species of any of the parks uh, in Utah. In fact, in the Colorado Plateau, it's, it's second only to, uh, to uh, Grand Canyon National Park in, in total number of, of species. Uh, last count, there were uh, 1,086 uh, different uh, plant species, um, uh, flowering plants, um, uh, gymnosperms and ferns in Zion. And uh, it's, it's very remarkable density of species given how, how relatively small the park is. It, it covers just 0.3% of the land mass of, of the state of Utah, uh, but has 30% of its uh, of the state's flora. So if you, if you want to see one plant in three in Utah, go, go to Zion National Park and, 
and you'll see those plants. Um, about 10 years ago or more, uh, 2009, uh, a colleague of mine uh, and I, uh, we wrote a, a checklist for the park service. Uh, we did this for a whole bunch of parks. And at that time there were uh, 991 species that were, were known, and which we thought was a you know, pretty high number. And um, uh, since that time in, in the, the following decade, we've actually increased that number by 10%. So we're up 95 more species in that, in that time. The graph, and I promise is the only graph I have, kind of shows the, the growth in the documentation of the flora over time. And uh, it's interesting because you can see some different peaks. Um, and, and I, I might add a caveat, you know, it says there were basically zero plants in 1900. That means just things that had been documented sort of scientifically, if you will. Obviously, you know, people, you know, native uh, settlers knew of plants in Zion, but nobody was recording those, those species uh, with herbarium specimens or in plant lists or uh, other you know, formal uh, documentation. There was a big uh, increase in the number of documented species uh, starting around the 1920s and 30s, shortly after the, the park was established. Uh, there were naturalists you know, documenting the flora. And then there was kind of a lull for, for a number of years. And then it, it really spiked again in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. And, and really, uh, we, we see this pattern actually in a lot of parks in, in the West, where uh, right around 1973, is when there's a really big increase in documentation of species. And, the, and, and the, the seminal event for that was the passage of the Endangered Species Act in 1973, which really prompted people to really start going out and, and finding rare species or really documenting floras better. So we see this repeatedly in, in other parts across the, of the West, at least. And then um, the, the graph uh, stops with the publication of this uh, paper in 2009 and, and we've actually added you know almost 100 species since then so there's another pulse of, of activity. Um, what we find interesting is the species we're discovering nowadays tend to be one of two types either they're very rare species or they're weeds that are newly established uh, in the park. We're not discovering new common species in the park. They, we've pretty much covered those. And here's the last text slide I'll have or, or data slide um, just to compare Zion with other uh, national parks and national monuments and, and, and so forth. The only one I don't have on here is the, the Bears Ears uh, National Monument, which was established uh, shortly after I did this study, actually. But you can see Zion has the most species by far, uh, followed by the Grand Staircase, which is interesting because the Grand Staircase is quite a bit larger. And so um, part of the reason is it has so many species is it's a factor of its, of its large area. So, so Zion stands out not only for its um, just because it has lots of species, but it's packed into a relatively small area. So if you were to normalize these data by uh, uh, thinking like the, the log distribution of the area or something, uh, it really stands out as being uh, a very rich uh, area. And the reason for this uh, is that Zion shown here in the red star is located, uh, like the real letters say, you know, it's all location, location, location. Um, you know, it's at the, at the juncture of four, major uh, ecoregions in the West. And the ecoregions are just geographic areas that have a relatively similar climate um, and terrain, substrates, the flora and fauna are relatively similar. And so they're sort of defined uh, biologically. Um, it's, it's a more meaningful way to look at distribution of species than state lines, which are just geopolitical construct. Um, and so we can see, you know, four of these regions are coming together right at time. Uh, most of the park is within the Colorado Plateau, uh, this, this area here, number 19, um, which is interesting because that's one of the, the most uh, richest areas in, the, in North America for endemic species. So that is species with very limited geographic ranges that, that perhaps are only found in the Colorado Plateau. Um, a lot of species coming in from the west and the, the Great Basin, uh, western Utah and Nevada, particularly on the west side of the park. Um, there's a Mojave flora that comes up the Virgin River from uh, um, the sort of the St. George area, uh, particularly in the southwest part of, of, of Zion, uh, which contributes a number of species not found uh, farther north or east. Um, and then this, this higher area was called the, the Wasatch Plateau. It's kind of a extension of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it's not as high as the Rockies, but it has a lot of uh, montane subalpine forest uh, kind of species. There's no alpine. But, um, Getting all those geographic areas together, though, really uh, increases the, the total diversity of species uh, within Zion. 
another driver of, of species diversity is there's just so many different habitats and, and geologic substrates uh, in particular. Um, Zion, and I'll talk about this in a few more slides in, in more detail, but um, a lot of variety in the, in the geology. Um, most of the geologic formations in Zion cover uh, the Triassic and Jurassic uh, periods, uh, which was an interesting time in the West. Um, There's a, a whole series, at that time, like California, Nevada didn't exist. So Utah was the West Coast in a way. And so the, the Pacific Ocean is lapping up uh, against the, the shore. So you get a, a series of marine and then sort of coastal uh, fluvial deposits. Um, later on, it became uh, an upland area, it became a big sand dune, which contributed to these giant uh, uh, sandstone cliffs. And then later, the sea came back. So it's just this hodgepodge of interesting uh, geologic uh, formations, and uh, many of which have interesting plant species associated with them. And then also with just the terrain of the park, uh, these, these, these plateaus, mesas, a lot of these narrow canyons, you got the, the river running through it. Uh, there's 96 different plant associations have been described by my ecologist uh, colleagues, uh, which is a lot for that uh, size of a, an area and, and quite a diversity where you can go from really shady, cool, cold, you know, canyons, uh, wetland, perennial wetlands, hanging gardens, and then you got these very dry uh, desert areas. You've got ponderosa pine forests on top of the, the higher elevations and, and so forth. Um, so it's really uh, an interesting you know, mix of, of habitats. Uh, I mentioned endemism uh, earlier. Uh, there are 46 different species that, of plants that are found either entirely only in Zion National Park or just extend a small ways outside the boundaries. Just to put that in perspective, you know, that's more species than are endemic to the state of Wyoming, uh, which is quite a bit larger, of course. Um, and, and, and of course, many of these endemics are among the rarer species uh, in, in the park, as you might expect. You know, they have a relatively small range, not very many uh, populations low population size. Here's a couple examples, uh, this uh, buckwheat, the slick rock wild buckwheat, um, a, a fairly common species within Zion. You can see it all along the West Rim Trail and the East Rim Trail. Um, it's kind of an interesting plant. It was, uh, it's an edible plant that uh, the, the native people were probably harvesting uh, to consume the, the fruit. Um, uh, but it doesn't, it's not found anywhere outside the park. It's very odd, even though there's similar habitats a little bit to the east uh, towards Canab, where I used to live in the Grand Staircase, never, never been found there. Um, this the Ridgeron, the Ridgeron Cain and I, um, you know, so there's a lot of sort of biblical kind of names in, in Zion, as, as Zion, of course, itself is. Um, this, this plant was only thought to be in Zion uh, and in, just outside the park, um, Mount Canaan. Uh, and then actually, I, I found it over in the Grand Staircase in a really interesting area called Lickwash a few years later. Uh, but that's its whole range in the in the whole world. And um, you know, it's these plants do tend to be uh, these endemic plants associated with a particular substrate. And I'll I'll talk about that more in a couple of slides. Uh, one other contributor to the, the species richness, uh, perhaps in a bad way, is there are a lot of introduced plants in in the park. Uh, at least 162 have been found, which is more on average than you find in Utah as a whole. Um, I mean, the, average, the, the percentage of the flora in Utah, the whole state that's non-native uh, introduced from outside of, of Utah, either from outside the country or elsewhere in, North, in the United States, uh, is about 13 and a half percent, and there's about 15 percent of the flora in Zion. Um, and it's interesting, a, a lot of, uh, you see this in a lot of national parks where the first record for an introduced plant will be in a park. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. You've got you know, vacationers coming from all over the place. Uh, they go to the campground, the, the car is dirty, there's mud in the wheel wells, it rains, the seeds in the mud come out and uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll germinate. Um, I found, I, I forget how many state records for new weed species I've found, it's like four or five um, and, and others have found um, in the campground at the, at the south entrance of, of Zion. It's a real hot spot. I like to go there every couple of years, just walk around, um, try not to interfere with the campers, but just uh, there's always some new species that's going to pop up, uh, weedy species. And uh, sometimes they don't last very long. Sometimes that's the place of entry and they spread. But uh, these national park uh, parking lots and campgrounds are a really good spot. Uh, for a botanist to find state records or, or, or bad weed species. Um, 
so uh, back to back to geology. That's one of my favorite uh, topics. Um, I'll, I'll just focus on four of the formations in, in Zion that really have a lot of interesting plants associated with them. Uh, probably the most important was Navajo sandstone, which more makes these these really massive uh, cliffs, uh, which the park is so uh, uh, famous for. Um, the Navajo was laid down in the Jurassic and upland period, um, and basically was a Sahara-like desert that extended from uh, Arizona and Nevada all the way up to Wyoming. Um, and big sand dunes, much like I mean, the analog is the the modern day Sahara in, in Africa. And uh, over time, that that sand is uh, uh, compacted, and of course, other formations forming on top of it, uh, you know, converted into into rock and into sandstone. Um, the Carmel also mentioned is the layer kind of right on top of the, the Navajo. Uh, that was a, a kind of a coastal uh, uh, environment uh, back when the when the ocean kind of came back again. Um, but those those are two of the formations you can see in this photo. So Navajo uh, has lots of interesting plants associated with it. Uh, one of them is this uh, this nice little uh, Castilea. It was on the first slide as well. This is uh, Castilea scabrida, which is is really one of the iconic plants in Zion. You see it on posters and you know, all the time. Uh, frequently misidentified if you go to iNaturalist. Uh, um, it does look a bit like Castilea cremosa, which is a, a, a much more common species, usually found in deeper soils uh, across the West. Uh, Scabrida is uh, found in these little cracks in the uh, slick rock in, in Navajo sandstone. And what's interesting is as Castileas are known for being partial parasites of other plants. And, uh, but often in these little, little patches of, of thin soil and in cracks, it can be the only plant growing there. So uh, it probably is not uh, parasitizing things all the time. Um, these plants do, are capable of photosynthesis too, of course. And Castileas are interesting. The actual flower, you can see my cursor here, it's this little green uh, tubular uh, sort of uh, uh, structure, that's the corolla. And then the uh, showy part is actually made up of the calyx or the sepals, and then these leaf-like bracts as well. And so they're kind of secondarily uh, uh, um, colorful to attract visually oriented pollinators. In this case, uh, probably hummingbirds would be the, the main pollinator. The, the common name for this plant is uh, it's called uh, East, Eastwood's Paintbrush. It's named for Alice Eastwood. I'll just mention briefly, a uh, very important Western botanist. Um, uh, she was uh, active from the mid 1800s into the 1930s, uh, named all kinds of species, lots of things named for her. Uh, she's, she's best known, uh, she worked for the, the California Academy in San Francisco. They had a very large herbarium there. Uh, California's got a very rich flora, long history of collecting. And uh, unfortunately, the, the herbarium burned down in the 1906 earthquake and fire. But Alice Eastwood was a hero who she and her assistant uh, rushed into the herbarium, well, in the building while it was on fire, and she rescued all the type specimens. Uh, the types are the, are the herbarium specimens that represent newly named species. They're sort of the, the typical form of that species, if you will. And, and scientifically, they're just invaluable. And she, uh, she pulled all the types out of the cabinet, and she wrapped them in a in an apron and lowered them down the stairwell, which was on fire, and, and they got the types out. Everything else burned down. Um, all the other specimens were lost, but the types were saved. So she's, she's a well regarded in botanical circles as a, as a real uh, heroine. Um, another kind of cool plant. Uh, it's a really early uh, uh, bloomer in the park, Pro probably the earliest blooming plant is this little uh, uh, buttercup called the juniper buttercup. Uh, it's kind of unusual for buttercups in that it's pink flowered instead of most of them are yellow, uh, sometimes white. And uh, you notice the leaves are very uh, finely dissected as well. Um, and it's uh, this will be out in the end of January, early February, some years. Um, it's just one of the you know kind of cute uh, plant species. Uh, some some botanists put this in its own genus now called Beckwithia, just you know, just to be ornery, I guess. Uh, kind of a cool plant, not the showiest thing, is uh, another Navajo endemic that's kind of fun to me uh, because of its name. This is a Spheromeria ruthii, uh, which is named after Ruth Nelson, who, uh, who wrote this really great book uh, up in the corner here. It's out of print, came out in the 70s. Uh, it was a, a really nice uh, guide to the plants of Zion. You can still find it on eBay for five bucks. I totally recommend getting it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a just a lovely book. Really nice uh, line drawings and. In fact, in my dream someday to revise this book. But, um, uh, 
Uh, Nelson was interesting. This this plant was named for uh, Scarameria, is a close relative of Artemisia or sagebrush, and, and uh, actually a recent study suggests that it really belongs in Artemisia. Um, it wasn't discovered or named until the 1970s, which is you know pretty late for a, a new species, and it was uh, first discovered growing in the, the masonry and the stone walls built in the 30s by the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, on the switchbacks that goes up to Angel's uh, Landing, um, an area of the park called Walter's Wiggles, um, not named for my, my dancing. Uh, you can go to my TikTok video if you want to see Walter's Wiggles, but um, uh, this is the zigzagging of the, the uh, trail. Um, but anyway, these plants were found growing in the, in the rock work. Uh, clearly, they weren't there before the rock work was built in the 30s, but um, elsewhere in the park, this plant will grow really high up on the Navajo, usually where there's a little bit of a limey uh, layer, and so it's hard to see. And it does look a bit like another Artemisia species, so it's unusual that it wasn't re recognized as a new species for so long. One of the interesting, interesting things about Ruth Nelson, that's her, her here uh, next to Ava Nelson, who uh, for those of you who know me well, I drone, drone on and on that, you know, I'm being from Wyoming. Uh, Ava Nelson was uh, like the pioneer botanist in, in Wyoming, uh, founded the Rocky Mountain Herbarium where, where I studied and, and um, uh, very well regarded. He was actually president of the university for a time. And uh, some people think that Ruth Nelson was his daughter. Uh, Ruth Nelson actually was his second wife. <laughs> uh, Nelson was a widower. Um, and uh, at the age of 71, he, he married Ruth Nelson, who was his graduate student. Uh, she was 34 at the time. And, uh, but you know, we, uh, they, they were in love and, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was somewhat scandalous at the time, but um, uh, uh, you know, he, he went on, so was active for another 10, 15 years in his career. And then uh, Ruth was a very accomplished botanist in her own right. And uh, like I said, published this great uh, flora and did a lot of work in the national park. So uh, I just, I have kind of a, a personal connection with the, with the Nelsons. I think it makes a fun story. Uh, one other uh, early uh, person of interest in the history of Zion, uh, this fellow, uh, Marcus Jones, who was the sort of the pioneer botanist in Utah, actually. And he, he actually collected the first uh, uh, herbarium specimens from what would become Zion. He actually was there in 1894 uh, before the monument was created or the park. Uh, and one of the plants he, he discovered is, was later named for him, uh, this Pensman, Pensman jonesii, uh, which is often thought to be a hybrid between a, a blue-flowered Pensman, Pensman lavis, and the red-flowered version, uh, a species uh, Pensman etonii. In many respects, it, it is kind of intermediate. This particular one has a little more of an etonii look to it in, in color. It's often kind of this burgundy color, uh, although they can be more purple too. Uh, morphologically, they're intermediate between the, the two. Uh, a colleague of mine has been studying the genetics of this, and he actually thinks it's a good as its own species. That uh, it's of hybrid origin, but now behaving as, a, as its own species. Very uncommon, actually. And um, it's interesting. Jones made the first collection of this, and he was a very astute uh, uh, botanist, named hundreds of species, that, and had a very modern species concept for for his era. Uh, where a lot of people were splitters and lumpers, and, and many of the names from that era haven't, haven't survived. Uh, but Jones had a really good knack for naming things. But it's interesting, he didn't actually name this, and the, uh, the first collection of it is a mixed specimen on the type of Pensman Lavis, which he took from Springdale. It's sort of interesting that this very uh, astute botanist didn't recognize this as if he just thought it was a color variant of uh, Pensman Lavis. Jones was a little bit notorious. He, uh, he was a geologist and botanist, kind of self-taught, uh, published extensively, and he created his own journal to name all his species. And uh, he was a little bit caustic towards some of his uh, professional rivals. And um, he's sort of famous for uh, taking down other people, um, particularly in reviewing their, their work. And he, he coined the phrase uh, bug hole botanist for, for one uh, esteemed uh, uh, colleague from, from New York Botanical Garden who he uh, who he disparaged as being a splitter of unnecessary species. Uh, he called him a bug hole botanist because he named plants based on the number of bug holes on their, on their leaves. So, um, different, different era, I guess. Uh, one of the really cool parts of the Navajo formation are these uh, hanging gardens that are these wetland areas associated with uh, steeps. 
um, that um, are present at the juncture of the junction of the of Navajo and the Cayenta Formation below it. The Navajo is uh, you know it's hundreds of feet thick, this the sandstone, and it, it seems counterintuitive, but uh, sandstone is actually quite porous, and so it's it's relatively easy for water to filter uh, through the spaces in the in the rock. Uh, and it takes a long time for it to, to move, but um, water will pass through the Navajo coming from snow melt or rainfall. And then when it hits this, uh, the Cayenta layer is a clay, it's very impervious. And so the water can't pass through the clay. And so it ends up, it just ends up going through the surface, out to the surface and it forms these wet uh, seepy areas on, on the uh, canyon walls. And uh, if there's enough flow of water and it's shady enough, it'll create, uh, you know, plants will, will grow where it's wet and shady. And it creates these uh, really delightful uh, little mini plant communities called hanging gardens. And they, um, they kind of get the name because they sort of look like the hanging gardens of, of Babylon. Sometimes their whole, the whole wall of the a wet area uh, will have plants. Sometimes it's more staggered like this, uh, this scene where there's uh, stair steps uh, coming. Uh, but the hanging gardens are really interesting. They, they have kind of their own flora and, and quite a few uncommon species are associated with them. One of them is this really interesting violet uh, called Clausen's violet. Uh, this is one of the park endemics only found in Zion. And arguably this is the second most, most rare species in the park. Um, probably should be listed as an endangered species because it's declining quite a bit. Um, I won't tell you where this hanging garden is because it's, it's not on a trail and it's, it's the most fabulous hanging garden in, in, in all of Zion. Um, but you know, the worst thing that could happen is if the park service built a trail to it, because um, there's trails to, to many of the, the, the really neat hanging gardens, emerald pools, uh, weeping rock. Uh, weeping rock, this species is gone. Um, it's being outcompeted by an invasive uh, perennial grass. Uh, but it also gets, you know, probably gets picked. You know, little kids, hey, mommy, here's a little flower, you know, and um, that's not so good uh, for the for the populations. But uh, this species is definitely declining. Uh, though overall, and um, uh, it's it's uh, it would be a shame to 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 lose that. Fortunately, I mean it's protected in the park, but uh, it's best protected when people don't know where to see it. Uh, another interesting hanging garden endemic is this one, this uh, Columbine uh, Foster's Columbine, which looks a whole lot like our uh, common uh, Western Columbine uh, Aquilegia formosa, and they are closely related. Um, Aquilegia fosteri is basically only found in Zion and just outside, uh, associated with hanging gardens in the Navajo sandstone, where it often co-occurs with this really pretty yellow one, uh, Aquilegia chrysantha, golden columbine, which is much more common, more widespread in, in the West. Um, what's interesting when the, when the two come together is they will hybridize. And often the hybrids are as common uh, as either parent. Here's the hybrid. You can see it, it's uh, kind of more of a pink color got a little bit of the yellow from Chrysantha, uh, but then sort of blended with the red from uh, Foster Eye, and, and fairly long uh, uh, spurs also. Um, the, the hybrids are interesting. Um, it's not entirely sure whether they can back cross with the, with the parents, uh, how fertile they really are, but they, uh, they can be fairly abundant when you, when you see them. And you see a lot of photos of this on things like iNaturalist where uh, it's kind of hard to, okay, it's not really its own, hasn't been named as a, as a species, but uh, it is an intermediate between the two. It's also interesting in these hanging gardens uh, you, is you get these species pairs uh, between plants found in the hanging gardens in the Virgin River in, in the Zion area and on the main stem of the Colorado in uh, southeastern Utah and, and elsewhere. The Virgin is a tributary of the Colorado, uh, joins up around Mesquite, Arizona, uh, Nevada. Um, but you'll get these species where they, they look similar to one another, but, but one species is, is from the Colorado River, the main stem, and one species is from the Zion area. And a good example is this uh, monkey flower. Um, it used to be called uh, Mimulus cardinalis. Uh, most of the Mimulus are now Erythranthi. It actually makes sense in this species. Um, Erythranthi actually means, translates as, uh, as red flower, uh, although most Mimulus are yellow. Uh, but uh, this one that used to be in Cardinalis is found in Zion, uh, but the other hanging gardens in southern Utah on the Colorado River have this other species, Eastwood's monkey flower. Remember Alice Eastwood again, uh, it all comes together, um, uh, but their ranges don't uh, overlap. And they do look superficially fairly, fairly similar. Uh, I mean, you can tell them apart, they're good species, but 
just interesting where uh, you know they they don't overlap in in their range. And there's a, a couple of other species that do this as well. There's actually a, an interesting uh, sedge. I didn't include the photo, but it's only found in Zion, and its closest relative is is found in it's actually fairly rare in the Indian Garden in the Colorado River. This uh, particularly monkey particular monkey flower recently has been split out as its own species, Erythranthe verbenacea. Um, and actually, it's, it's pretty legit. It's different than Cardinalis. Uh, the, the, it's kind of based on some stigma and anther characters, but that's it's a reliable difference. And uh, it turns out this Bourbonacea species is only found in southeast Utah and into Arizona and, and a little bit into Mexico. And one of my favorites, uh, kind of a common uh, hanging garden species, is uh, the Zion shooting star. Uh, this has gone under as change its name a bit, uh, Dodecathion pulchellum, variety Zionensi, uh, sometimes also called Primula pulchella or Primula passiflora, var Zionensi. Uh, the shooting stars, they kind of look like comets. The, steep, uh, the sepals and petals sort of flare backwards uh, like a shooting star, that's the common name. Um, and they're interesting, the uh, stigma and style kind of jut out and uh, these are pollinated by bumblebees and they, as they approach the vibrations from the bumblebee kind of shakes the pollen loose called buds pollination. Uh, it's kind of a, a neat one. Um, the Zion subspecies or variety is recognized by its really big leaves. They're really quite wide, um, which could be an adaptation growing in the, in the shade, arguably, uh, but it seems to be a reliable uh, taxonomic uh, character. And kind of going with that Zion theme, there's, uh, there's nine species in all that have Zion in their name. I always find that kind of interesting uh, in their Latin name. Although Zion is spelled differently. Um, you know, technically, there's no Z in Latin, uh, so it's based on the place name. Uh, so you have things called Zionis, uh, Zionensis, or Zionis, is, as if you want to be more grammatically correct. Um, this Jamesia is a, a variety. Zionis is a, a rare plant uh, from, from Zion and a few other hanging gardens in southern Utah. Uh, Zion daisy uh, is found in the uh, Navajo Slick Rock. Uh, also extends up towards uh, Cedar Breaks as well and Grand Staircase. And there's a few other things with that name too, but I just sort of find that interesting. There's so many place names. Um, so above the, the Navajo, we have the Carmel Formation, which is uh, um, this kind of limey uh, clay layer. And there's a suite of about five, six uh, rare plants associated with that, that layer. Uh, one of them is this really cool violet. You can tell I like violets, I guess. Uh, the Charleston Mountain Violet. Um, one of the unusual things about it is it's yellow, because you know violets are blue, and you know. Uh, but there are some yellow violets, and um, this one has really cool leaves too. They're they're kind of like a look like a half dollar, and they have these really cool hairs that go backwards on the on the backside. And uh, this this plant uh, is one of the rare species in, in Zion. It's only found in the Carmel. Um, found a little bit to the east towards Kanab. And then it's not found again until you get the, to the Charleston Mountains, which are outside of Las Vegas. And so it's not found in between. So it's kind of, kind of an unusual uh, bipolar distribution. Um, so about 2008 or nine or so, um, Park hired me to do a study on these rare plants because there's a big wildfire in the uh, Dakota Hills area, kind of the Northeast corner of the park. Um, at that time, and there was concern that these pl these rare plants might have been impacted by the fire, and that's uh, actually there were more concerns that some weeds were going to come in. Um, and th when they were staging for the firefighting, uh, they realized after the fact that where they were flying helicopters to you know douse the flames, there was a big patch of uh, of uh, uh, bad weeds uh, nearby. So they were concerned that the weeds were coming in. But um, th the good thing is these these plants are adapted to wildfire. It's not infrequent in these areas. And they did fine. All the rare plants bounced right back. Um, wasn't so good for the ponderosa pine forest. They really uh, took, a, took a hit. Um, but other plants did respond to the fire. Um, the prickly poppies did really well. It's a uh, uh, really showy uh, native plant, not particularly a rare plant, but uh, you know, very large uh, flowers. And uh, they're kind of thistle-like uh, spiny uh, foliage, but they, they responded well. And uh, the oak trees also really responded. The Gamble's oak is, is the native oak in the Colorado Plateau. Um, and uh, two years after the fire, those, those oaks, they had all burned down, but they had re-sprouted and were already about six feet tall and uh, doing, doing pretty well. Uh, shifting gears slightly, the, another interesting formation is the Moen Kopi uh, and, the, and the 
uh, Carmel. These are two of the uh, formations found in the southwest corner of the park, in the more kind of Mojave uh, kind of uh, region of the, of the park. The Mongkopi is an interesting area, it, uh, a formation. It's got a lot of gypsum in it, which is uh, not an easy uh, substrate for, for plants to grow in. And so you end up getting a lot of rare and endemic species uh, that are capable of growing in, in gypsum. Some of which are Pathelias, uh, which is uh, kind of an interesting uh, genus, uh, Hydrophilaceae, often very uh, prickly, spiny, or often very glandular, uh, real sticky. Uh, there's 12 different Phacelias in the park, so it's a, it's a good place to see, see them. This one's kind of a cool one, Palmer's Phacelia. It looks a lot like a Christmas tree in shape. It's about you no know, foot and a half tall, but it has uh, kind of a, a classic Christmas tree uh, shape. And then these uh, little uh, scorpioid cymes of white flowers uh, are kind of kind of distinctive. Another cool one related is uh, Facilia Pulcella. Uh, if you know your uh, Italian Pulcella, it's uh, a beautiful uh, Facilia, uh, which it is. Uh, this was a little annual. Um, the other one was a biennial. At, um, and it can be really abundant after a wet winter, wet spring, but uh, dry winter, you won't see hardly any of them. Uh, they're all underground, just uh, persisting as seeds, really waiting until a, a good year to, to germinate. And they can last in the seed bed for, for quite a while. And one other one that's not a rare plant, but, uh, but a cool plant is this uh, shrubby uh, indigo bush, Fremont's indigo bush, um, Dorothamnus fremontii, sometimes called Dahlia fremontii. Uh, this was an important uh, medicinal plant for the native cultures. Um, uh, they would use the leaves to make a tea, uh, you know, sort of treat tummy ache. Seems like all the medicinal plants are for tummy ache, um, but also the, the dye from the, from the flowers. This isn't the same plant as indigo, like you get indigo the dye, although that's also a, a pea. Um, but it's, it's a real showy plant and fairly common, kind of indicative of that formation. And then uh, another one, last one, uh, just showing um, all the biological soil crust that, that occurs in these gypsum soils in particular. They're found elsewhere as well, but uh, they, they really seem to respond to uh, the, the gypsum -y soils. And, and the soil crust is this sort of grayish uh, uh, crust uh, associated with this cool plant, uh, Camasonia perii, or uh, Pylismia perii, I believe, um, an annual, uh, and not a particularly common one. Um, found only in the Southwest. Um, but the biological crust is, uh, is a kind of a mixture. A lot of it's algae, uh, sometimes blue-green algae that um, fixes nitrogen and also helps hold the soil together so it doesn't blow away. And also uh, in better developed areas, you, you get some lichens and there's some lichen here and then also some moss. And the, and the biological soil crust is quite fragile, uh, easily trampled, um, easily broken up. And so there's really nice areas of this in, in the park, um, off the trails, uh, but uh, it's a kind of an overlooked, uh, interesting ecological uh, phenomenon in the Southwest. So generally, I'll, the last one I'll talk about is kind of my favorite formation, uh, not a particularly extensive area in the park, uh, but it has a lot of really unusual plants associated with it. Um, the Chinle is a, uh, one of the older formations, it's a, a uh, Triassic uh, formation. It was and it's basically made up of volcanic ash that came from northern Arizona and was deposited on what at the time was a coastal area. And so it's uh, very rich in clay, and um, it's a it's a kind of clay that absorbs water readily when it's wet, and then it it uh, kind of holds that water actually, and then when it dries up, it it cracks, and you, uh, it's really hard for plants to get established in that kind of shrinks well. Uh, kind of clay, um, and it's hard for them to get water uh, out, of the, out of the system. So not very many plants can grow there, and a lot of them that do are annuals or short-lived perennials. And here's an example of a few of the annual plants. Um, one that I think is kind of cool, it's uh, this a plant called Baird's Evening Primrose down the bottom quarter. Notice how the leaf is almost the same color as the soil. They're really hard to see when they're not in flower. I mean, the flowers aren't very big. They're about the size of your uh, pinky nail uh, or smaller. Um, but the leaves are the same brown color as, or purplish brown color as the as the soil. And uh, you know why the plant would want to uh, hide itself like that? Uh, maybe it's just a coincidence. It's hard, hard to know. We, we need more more data. Um, really cool plant is the chia, uh, Salvia uh, columbari, which is a, a mint, a little annual mint. Um, if you know Salvia dorea is a shrub, actually it's its cousin. Uh, it's a little unusual to have a shrub and an annual in the same genus. Um, 
the, the phase that grows on the chinle is has white flowers, and then the, the typical version of the plant has purple flowers. Um, but the, the white flower is consistent on the chinle and, and was recognized uh, by Stan Welsh as a new variety. And I, and I think it's actually, it could be named its own species. It's, it's fairly distinct. Only found on the chinle though, within Zion and then a little bit um, to, the, to the east in the Grand Staircase. The chia, uh, if you have a chia pet at home, um, those seeds are another salvia species, although it's uh, annual from, uh, um, I think from Spain or something, uh, uh, non-native species. But um, if you ever let a flower, it might look like I've never seen a chia pet flower. Um, one of the coolest plants though is uh, Zion's only listed endangered plant, which grows on the chinle. This is the uh, Fibwitz milk vetch, the Stragulus ampullarioides. Uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to recognize. I mean, Stragulus is a big genus and it can be tricky, but this one's fairly easy. Uh, big white flowers and the fruits, can't see on the photo quite so well, but they're on these really long stalks. And there's a big stalk at the base of the fruit pot itself. And you'll notice a lot of them are, are chewed off. This, most of Stragulus species are, are toxic to grazing animals, uh, but this one appears not to be very toxic and actually is browsed quite a bit by deer and rabbits, uh, which can be uh, a problem. Uh, but really the easiest way to find this plant, to identify it, uh, if you, and it's along the Petrified Forest Trail in the southwest part of the park, uh, is look for these cages. Um, these, these hardware cloth cages were set up uh, for a study to, uh, to really look at the reproductive success uh, of the species, but they're actually really useful to keep things from eating. This plant. And so uh, after the study was completed, uh, we talked the park into keeping these cages just to, but these plants are getting cloppered by deer, deer and rabbits. So uh, you know, having the cages, at least you know, look out many flowers there are in fruits. Uh, we've got some good reproduction uh, going. And like I said, it is listed as endangered. There's only six populations that we know of in the whole world. And, and most of the plants are in Zion. 75% uh, of the, the population is, is protected within the park. So uh, that's an important contribution uh, that the park uh, makes. Uh, one other cool one, uh, this is a little esoteric perhaps, another uh, milk vetch, Astragalus, um, that's essentially endemic to the Zion area is this variety, Astragalus flavus var higginsii. Um, Astragalus flavus is usually yellow flowered, as you might guess from the name. Uh, here it's white, and some taxonomists think, eh, you know, it's not that different, but um, what's really interesting is this, the odor of the plant. It's typically, Astragalus flavus is known to be a selenium accumulator, and uh, Selenium is this uh, uh, chemical element that uh, actually, you know, we, it's needed as a nutrient at, you know, extremely minute amounts, but in too much uh, quantity, it can actually be uh, sort of toxic to, to livestock. And uh, it's got a very distinctive smell uh, to it. Um, and, and these plants that, that accumulate selenium, they're really useful to point out to people who are grazing livestock, you know, not to graze your cows in this area. Um, they're like the canary in the coal mine in, in, a, in a way, um, because basically other plants are accumulating selenium but don't release the smell, but have the compound and you know, grasses and whatnot that the cows might eat will make them sick. If you see these plants growing there, you shouldn't be grazing there. Um, but this one is interesting. So, you know, normally the selenium smell is very distinctive. I, I described it here. It smells like a rotten egg in a dirty sock left out in the sun. Uh, it, it, it's not a pleasant smell. The variety Higginsii, has a really nice smell, at least when it's fresh. Uh, when, it, when it gets a little older, it actually loses scent, but it smells exactly like grape popsicles. I always point this out on field trips and, and people are always incredulous until they smell it and they say, oh my God, it smells like a grape popsicle. Because um, it's true. Uh, anyways, it, you know, chemically it's very different and uh, you know, that, that has to have some taxonomic importance, I, I think. Um, it's probably a good species, really. Um, so anyway, I want to close out with just, just a few other species I want to talk about that are kind of cool in Zion uh, that don't necessarily fit into these bins of these unusual uh, geology. And uh, one of my favorite types of plants are, are ferns. And, and Zion's a great place to see ferns. It, it seems counterintuitive uh, because it's desert. And, uh, but all these, these cliffs and these shady areas and these wet places, are those are places ferns like to grow. And so uh, Zion's, it, it's got the most fern diversity of any place in, in Utah, 29 different species of, of ferns and, and fern relatives like Salad. It's really great place to see them. And, and some uncommon ones too, like this uh, rock, uh, rock holly fern, uh, which is not very common elsewhere. 
what's really a weird one is this one though, the black spleen wart, which is basically a European, Eurasian, African species. Um, although it shows up in a few places in North America. Uh, it shows up in Colorado, Arizona, Mexico, and in Zion. And actually the North American material was named as its own species, the Splenium andrusii by Avon Nelson, who we met earlier. Uh, but uh, morphologically, genetically, they're really identical to the material from uh, Eurasia and Africa, uh, which really raises some interesting biogeographic questions. That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. You know, how do these plants get there? You know, and, and, and ferns, if you'll recall from Botany 101, you know, reproduce by spores rather than seed. And, and spores are quite small and uh, potentially could be lofted up into the atmosphere you know, in high wind events and, and maybe blown you know, across the ocean or something, at least initially to get established and then maybe leapfrog from other places. Um, but it, it's really unusual biogeographic uh, pattern to see. It's, it's not one of my favorite plants in the park. Uh, and Zion, it's got a lot of uh, cacti species. A lot of people like cacti, of course. And, uh, and Zion's really, it's, uh, I call it the kind of the patent place of, of cacti, as there's all this hybridization and intrigue uh, going on. Um, and really, uh, particularly in the, the prickly pear, uh, the Apuntia species. And one of the biggest culprits is this one, uh, Apuntia aurea, uh, yellow uh, Apuntia would be translation, uh, usually usually yellow, uh, but it, it can cross with every other Apuntia that there is pretty much. And um, interesting thing about aurea is you notice um, it doesn't have any spines. It does have the glockids on the, the little, uh, the glockids are the glass like really sharp, uh, um, spinelets, if you will, but doesn't have the, the, the long spines like you, you typically see on a prickly pear. Um, and that's its, its real distinctive uh, characteristic. It's got quite a small range, actually, uh, kind of centered in Zion and then towards Pipe Spring uh, National Monument and towards uh, Grand Staircase. Uh, within that area, it's relatively common and it does cross with all these other species. And these other two photos are actually hybrids. This is probably a hybrid with uh, Phaeacantha. Um, and then this one, I, I'm not sure what it is. It could be a cross with uh, uh, Polyacantha or Aranacea. Um, I showed this photo actually to three different cactus experts I know and got three different answers. And I actually thought it was a fourth thing. <laughs> so, so none of us really agreed what that case was. Um, it's, it's quite complicated, o only they really know. What's interesting is um, I don't have a photo, but uh, you'll see a lot of pink flowered cacti in the park and almost all the pink punches are hybrids. Uh, uh, between a punch and something else, or, or these other punches. About every permutation of a punch is they can hybridize. The other cactus genera are, are equally complicated, at least taxonomically. They keep changing the names. Um, we have the pincushion cactus, which uh, used to be uh, Oryphantha, uh, now in the genus Escobaria. That's a little uh, pink flowered one, um, kind of a cute little guy. The uh, Choyas. Uh, uh, they're put in their own genus now. They used to be in the puncha, now they're cylindro puncha. Um, for, for good reason, they're actually pretty different. Uh, you know, the shape of the pads are very cylindrical. And uh, the, the spines are unique uh, because they have a little papery sheath that covers the spine. And uh, I used to like to show this um, on field trips where you, you have to, you know, be careful, obviously, because needles are really sharp on choyas. Uh, you grasp it carefully and tug. And uh, the, the sheath comes off and it's just this little hollow uh, tube uh, left over, papery. Um, that's kind of a neat parlor trick uh, to, to show people. Uh, and then lastly, the Echinocereus, that, the names keep changing on this. Uh, this used to be Echinocereus triglocidiatus variety mojavensis, recognized by the really long wavy spines. Um, triglocidiatus is only in New Mexico now and hardly has any spines. And, and the Zion material is probably coccinius, but this, Maybe a hybrid. I mean, it's it's a mess. Um, yeah. I mean, they're cool, but the, taxonomically, it's just it's just a mess. Uh, what's really interesting are the all the penstemons in Zion. I mentioned the Jones penstemon earlier. Uh, there's 18 different penstemon species, uh, seven of which are local uh, or regional endemics. Um, penstemons are kind of fun to key out. They're actually not that hard to key and flower as long as you have the stamens. Um, but there's quite a variety of colors and sizes. Uh, Palmer's penstemons are real common one. Very large flower. Uh, they're pollinated by bumblebees. Uh, Utah penstemon is a relatively small flowered, red uh, flowered species pollinated by hummingbirds. And then the, the purple flowered ones uh, like Higgins uh, 
beard tongue hair is uh, bee, bee pollinated. Um, so it's interesting. I forgot to mention with the, the Joneses, uh, Penstemon was thought to be a hybrid. And you have the one parent, Etonia, is hummingbird pollinated, and the, the blue flowered parent would be a bee pollinated. So, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, what, how, what happened? You know, it was the, was the hummingbird colorblind? Was it thirsty? You know, what, you know, it's hard to say what these, what these things are think. Uh, for anybody who's ever been in a tunnel jam on the, on the big tunnel, the mile long tunnel on the east entrance, uh, you see lots of flock is growing along the side of the road when you've got nothing else to do uh, while you idle or hopefully turn off your car. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, Jones's flocks is really common along. And it's a very droopy uh, perennial uh, flock species with uh, pink petals. Usually the, the, it's a variety of flocks, Ostra montana, it's usually white. And uh, this the pink flowered version is uh, common in Zion, variety Jones EI, uh, named again for Marcus Jones. And all comes all comes back together. Now my my favorite plant actually in Zion, uh, at least among the more common species, is uh, this Lewisia, uh, Lewisia brachycalyx. Um, it's got these beautiful white flowers, lots of petals. Uh, actually, technically they're probably. Uh, um, sepals, uh, but but anyway, you know, real showy. Uh, the flowers are about the size of a half dollar. Uh, as these kind of succulent leaves at the base, when they're in flower, the the whole uh, you get a whole um, like a terrace. It grows in ponderosa pine, open areas, and it looks like somebody uh, lost a bunch of tissues uh, that are that are all uh, blown around in the wind. Um, it's just the sort of the effect that you get from a big population. And what's so interesting is it's, it's only in bloom for like three days and you gotta be there exactly the right time. And I remember, well, when I took this photograph, um, you know, seeing it and, and uh, wanting to go back, uh, I was doing a field trip or something, wanted to go back um, just a few days later and documented again. And they were all gone <laughs> just in that short time. They had, they had flowered, uh, been uh, pollinated, uh, and then they, they basically go underground um, or, or the, the flowers close up and, and they're really hard to see where, you know, just, a, uh, you know, 72 hours earlier, you know, the, it was carpeted with these things. And, and then a few, 72 hours later, I couldn't find them, even though they were still there. It was, uh, it was really kind of, kind of fun. So uh, I, I lost track. I think I still have 1,043 species to go through, but I know we're going to be short on time. Um, so I'll, I'll stop uh, with those, but um, I, I just, you know, this is a slide I've used before, but uh, I think it's appropriate in our current times. Um, you know, try to get out, see these flowers, you know, I mean, if you can go to Zion, do, if you can't, you know, wait till next year when everybody's vaccinated and everything's good again. Um, I guess the point I want to make is uh, what's, what's so great about Zion is, you know, there's, there's still species to be found. We haven't found them all. We're still going to find more. Um, maybe some will be new, you know, the science. Um, but, but what's so fun about botany and plant hunting is, um, you know, you can always find stuff that's new for you, at least. So, you know, keep your own personal life list of plants or um, just, you know, keep a curious mind and open heart and all that stuff. You always have fun. I mean, there's always something to see on a, on a plant walk for, for sure. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, end and uh, entertain any questions. Walter, thank you. That was wonderful. I've been there and it is very exciting to see everything. We have two questions and people can pop them in the chat if any more questions if they have them and I'll read them to you. Uh, Kathy Darrow asks, do you have an inventory of non-vascular flora of Zion as well? Uh, I don't. Um, I do know uh, actually, Kathy and I, my our mutual friend Tom Nash, did a, a lichen uh, flora of Zion, um, probably back in the '80s, I think. Um, I'm not aware of a bryophyte flora. Wouldn't surprise me if someone has worked on that. I I don't know the bryophytes that well. Um, I I'm not directly familiar with that, but uh, if it hasn't been done, somebody should do that. That'd be a good project. Okay, Kathy also added that Salvia Hispanica from Mexico and Central America is used for chia pet pets and cultivated for seeds as edibles. 
Oh, the Hispanic. I was thinking it was from uh, Spain, but okay. Yeah. And that's the right piece. The, and from the chat, um, wait a second. Um, oops, I lost it. The Zy, um, Ron asked, Ron Klump asked, what kinds, what about that very rare plant, the shrub that grows along the rivers? Tamarisk? Oh, tamarisk? Tamarisk? Uh, is that what tam, Tamarisk? T A M A R I S K. T A M A R I S K. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't call it a rare plant, and it's not native. Uh, tamarisks are introduced. They they come from uh, actually well from Eurasia and, and Africa. Um, the ones in the park are mostly from China, actually, or uh, Kazakhstan or you know Central Asia. Um, and there's yeah, uh, tamarisk is interesting. It's um, it was brought over as a flood control species, and it's actually a very pretty flower. Uh, it's kind of ornamental, uh, but it does escape, and it does really do well in wetland areas. Um, what's interesting is we we kind of mimic the habitat in some ways of wetlands in Kazakhstan, um, where there's mudflats exposed, and so it often will be associated with reservoirs or or human in, impacted wetland areas. Uh, which is one of the reasons it's hard to get rid of because we basically have created in it, it, its habitat that it likes here. And so uh, they, they do quite well here. And um, they, there, there may be, well, there's, there's two or three different species. The taxonomy is a little complicated. Um, plus they hybridize in the new world um, where they didn't in the old country, either they didn't overlap or they just, they didn't, didn't hybridize there. But um, so, so what we have, in North America is kind of its own thing in a way, um, which raises an interesting uh, scientific ethical question, if you will. You know, uh, if, uh, if two introduced species hybridize and form a new species here, is that a native plant? Um, you know, ar arguably it is. <laughs> um, but um, in, in any event, tamarisk can, um, yeah, I mean, it, it can be a real problem. There's efforts to contain it. Um, you know, you can cut it and treat it with uh, some herbicide on the stumps right away. And, you know, it, um, you, have, you have to stay on it a, a lot, but it's actually considered pretty bad introduced invasive weedy species. Okay, Laurie would like to know, do you feel comfortable revealing the location or locations of the Louisia? Oh, the Louisia, that was in the Colob area. Um, and it's actually right off the road to the Overlook. Um, the, the collab overlook, <laughs> I can't remember, I don't have the map in front of me, um, but it's, it's off, it's, it's a, it's a gravel road, but it's, um, there's a campground nearby, and, um, yeah, it's not really a big secret, it's not a rare plant, necessarily, uh, but, um, and I'm trying to think the best time to be there, I think, is in, like, mid-June, uh, it's a very short window, and, and it kind of varies from year to year, too, which makes it kind of, Fun, you know, it's like one year it might be June twentieth is the best time, and another year it might be June thirteenth. And um, you just, it's just one of the fun things, you know. I, there's several years where I never saw it at all, and then you know, one year was really in profusion. And um, I remember we, we actually did a, a, a Pensman Society field trip to Zion in um, twenty fourteen, I believe, uh, and the year before, um, uh, the fellow who, who helped organize the trip, uh, Mike Stevens. Uh, who, who studies Pensman, a, a geneticist at, at BYU, uh, he and I scoped out this trip and found all these great Pensmans up there. And, and we went back one year to the day uh, for the Pensman Society. And um, there had been, there was a cold snap just a few days before, like a week before, and it actually snowed. And uh, this was in May. And um, and everything was was behind, and, and none of these pensmans were out. And we had all these pensman experts from all across the country, and pensman aficionados, <laughs> and we're showing them vegetative uh, pensman plants, where you know that exact day, you know, the year before, you know, was just a profusion of them. Uh, should have been the prime time to be there. So you just never know. That's one of the fun things about, about botanizing is you know, every year is different. So. Okay, Wendy asks, does Zion have any calochortus? Uh, calochortus. Calicordis, thank you. Calicordis, yeah, that's sago lily or mariposa. Um, yeah, that does. There's uh, two or three species. Um, the most common one is the sago lily, uh, Calicordis metallii. 
Nataliana, um, which is the state flower of Utah, actually. Um, and that's the, the the white one with the purple uh, little chevron uh, inside the petals. But, uh, yeah, that's fairly common there. Okay. Um, got some wonderful thank yous from uh, Kay saying it was nice to revisit Zion. And that's all the questions and chats we have. Walter, I can't thank you enough for this delightful vacation. Yeah. <laughs> or a staycation, and, I guess. And, and to feel the sun of the desert on my back, yeah. my face, so to speak. So I, I know everyone who watched enjoyed this. So thank you so very much. No, oh, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Go back and watch the game. <laughs> Again, I'd like to remind you that this will be recorded. Was recorded. <laughs>